I'm kind of intrigued by the fact that you come from an academic background and now you're running a very successful company. So how did your academic background help you, you know, in, in starting and running uh, your company? So there is objective here and there is subjective. So first of all, uh, what happens in, uh, in uh, technical sciences, which is, uh, remains in contrast to natural sciences, is the technical sciences now is a big uh, uh, competition for funds, for projects. Uh, uh, professors at the technical universities are obliged to work with industry. And in, in most countries, like in Germany, for example, in it's, it's not only in Poland, in Germany, uh, also in uh, in US, and I, I'm not sure about Britain because I didn't work in Britain. Mm. It's uh, the the it, is, it is the same there. Yeah, quality of the the uh, university faculty or department depends on cooperation with industry. So you see, I, when uh, I started as a theoretician, as um, doing. Uh, advanced mathematics uh, optimization, nonlinear optimization, then applied to telecommunication problem. And then, you know, uh, I started to get a lot of contracts or I attracted contracts uh, working in Poland, in, in Australia, Canada, France. So you see, after maybe 20 years of uh, working as such a contracted researcher, I said, why should I work for the university? Maybe I should. Uh, keep some uh, contracts for myself and develop company based on that because you know, I mean, it's, uh, it's, it's not nice. I mean, when you think it about in general terms, uh, that now universities are in fact corporations, so they don't do much, uh, much research. I mean, everything is oriented on, say, short term uh, results. Uh, this is not what universities should do, the universities should do long term research and then bring, you know, some uh, scientific values. Nowadays, technical universities just do what companies are doing, not only in Poland, it was Europe for sure. All right. But with your company, and, and for a company in Poland to be uh, extremely successful, do they need to, to have an international presence? Do, do they need to expand to the international stage? Yeah, from, from, the, from the very beginning. So, I mean, it, it goes two ways. First of all, because I come from the West and I proved myself and I saw a lot of Polish people who proved themselves even before uh, political transition in Poland. So I said, okay, we can uh, go international, and which we did. But then, you know, like, uh, see, uh, IT is a product which I call, uh, which is transferable. It's not like construction industry, which must be loc made local, you know. If you have IT product, it should prove itself in many countries. So the first thing, you know, other because nobody in Poland, even in the 90s, would buy a product which was a Polish product. Everybody was wanted to have a product which is proven internationally. So that's the first thing. Second thing, you know, uh, when we were uh, 300, 400 people, we, we could, you know, uh, Polish market was big enough for us to to finance our growth. I mean, the development of of um, uh, uh, of IT product because we are software house, we develop product. But then you know it was uh, uh, when we started to have 2,000 people, it was quite obvious that we must go international because if you develop a product like billing system for telecom, there is not enough telecom companies in Poland to support R&D in that area. So I mean, it, it's uh, in a way you know, especially now if you have very small margins, really you need to expand the scope of your offer both geographically, I mean, and, and as regards branches, types of enterprises and products. So it was, it was a must for us to, to go international. Okay. Uh, we talked a little bit about earlier, you mentioned the fact that vendors have a certain responsibility and end users have a certain responsibility. Uh, in that context, uh, what, what is your approach to vendor social responsibility uh, in the context of the state's uh, digitization initiatives? Well, it's, uh, I'm not sure if we have enough time and money to, <laughs> to, be, <laughs> to be really active in that, uh, in that area, you know, so, uh, yeah. And, and then uh, we are very much focused on, um, uh, on IT people. So in the, as regards IT people, we have a very vast uh, program. 
So for your information, every year for last uh, several years, we organize uh, I, uh, internship program with uh, 300 uh, students after second and third year of, uh, of university education. They come to us, uh, they are organizing groups, they get uh, topics of research which are related to real life uh, projects from industry, they get mentored. Um, then we have summer innovation labs, so we work with universities, we give lectures, but it's, more, it's not oriented toward the uh, public at large, you know, so, but I am not sure if it is our mission, in fact, you know, to, 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 to address such. I mean, for example, recently I was asked for a comment about this uh, thing in the United States where, where, some, uh, where it was discovered uh, uh, that um, uh, uh, U.S. government or agencies of U.S. government are, you know, um, say, do uh, intelligence in Internet. So I, I don't think it's uh, my role to comment on it, you know. So I mean, I am very much for a, uh, for, for, a, for I mean, in, in advance. So it's not that I'm not afraid, but it's not my role, you know. I don't do study in that area, and I mean, I don't, I'm not expert. I don't have time to read details. I don't have time to work out my opinion. I am just entrepreneur, you know. So I can comment on, uh, on, pro on problems which are of my everyday interest. So uh, that's why, as I said, as regards uh, education, so, for example, in this room, there are many people in general, you know, Comarch is known as an uh, um, organization which uh, educated and during the last 20 years a very large number of people who went then to governmental organizations and to industry. So I think as regards uh, our social responsibility, this is a role of our company. So and, and we, we try to do it well. I mean, let me pick up that same theme. Of you, you, you used several times the word IT people. And we all do that. <laughs> now, the, the, one of the big questions is, how would you recognize one of those now? And how would you recognize an IT person in the future? You would, I mean, your background, and we were sharing earlier on mine also in, you know, hard, solid sciences. Um, I now deal with stuff which is much more to do with humanities and, you know, and, and as the, um, the owner of a company, chief executive of a company, actually you deal much more with, with humanities and soft sciences and so on. One of the trends that I personally found fascinating was when I first saw that Intel, you know, the manufacturer of the foundational level of so much, um, has employed a chief digital anthropologist, somebody from the humanities side. So the question really is, what would an IT person of the future look like? What kind of skills do you try to get into Comarch now, and, and how do you, where do you get those from? Uh, so you see, uh, the answer is simple. I told you before this session that I, my main thinking is term of responsibility. So for me, IT person is a person who is responsible for developing uh, uh, IT services and products, implementing. So it's main responsibility of the, that person is to develop and so do, do IT things. My son-in-law, for example, he is a banker he's, and he's much more skillful in IT than some employees of my company, you know, because he knows a lot about computers. Uh, but this is not his main responsibility, right. so he's not IT person. He's a banker. So this, this, this is um, how we can easily categorize uh, people and then, uh, yeah. And what kind of um, approach do you take to, uh, to measuring, assessing, I mean, measuring is often difficult, but assessing the quality and capability of those people? As you said, and Alvin and I are very much aware, as people from outside this country, the, uh, the extraordinarily high reputation for technical and scientific education that there is here. Um, uh, uh, and you can measure those things, as it were, in a kind of academic sense, but how then do you apply them in terms of their ability to add value to a business? What, what sort of approach do you uh, take? Uh, uh, you know, so uh, during the last 20 years, of course, because I'm a scientific person, mm. yeah, so it was always my wish and dream uh, to come with methods to measure performance of people. Uh, and then we had at the beginning of Comarch of our company, we had several programs uh, to um, to evaluate uh, IT people, uh, different metrics. Uh, we adopted metrics from the market. We tried to come with our own metrics. And uh, uh, I, I'm sorry to say that I mean it's uh, now I think it's uh, unmeasurable yeah, because okay. why is unmeasurable? <laughs> because you have so many dimensions yes. that you cannot capture them with one. Index usually, you know, measuring performance, you want to come with one index, and then it is uh, very different. I mean, it's an obvious way. One people, are, some people are more creative. Some people 
better, are better coders and so on. So we have many dimensions. And then uh, uh, what we have now in, uh, in, uh, in our company is a high potential program. Everybody has. But then uh, the people are nominated to that program based on opinion of their uh, colleagues, superiors. Okay. So, so it's a word of mouth, basically, and okay. it's, uh, yeah. how it operates. Especially that we are a company without, I mean, with very simple hierarchies, of course, but then responsibilities are not so strictly, I mean, figure whatever I say, responsibilities are not so strictly defined that you have a list of responsibilities, uh, right? Yeah. So, I mean, we, have a, we are responsible for uh, creative design, but then it's not atomized in, in list of uh, detailed yeah. tasks or and so yeah. on. So yeah, yeah, yeah. It, it's almost, I mean, I, sometimes when I was uh, uh, working as a CIO, some of the job descriptions I wrote almost said, your responsibility is to think for yourself, work out what to do, and then do it. Yeah. Oh, it's a different type of industry, I think, so then it's, uh, it's not, I would say, it's not, I mean, it's difficult to say, like, in traditional industry, fourth factor, uh, what yes. you should do and what you should not yes. do. I mean, so. I, I mean uh, just, just to touch again on that, um, on your background as a theoretical physicist and, and looking at the, you know, the figures one would admire there, Schrodinger and Einstein and Paul Dirac and so on, and, and what sort of connection would you see that there is between between that and what you do now, or is there no. is there none? It was something you were happy to do then, and you're happy <laughs> to do this, but you crossed a bridge sometime. I would say, I, I recently I got a, a, an award as IEEE, IEEE is a large yes, I know. Of association, distinguished industry uh, leader, and I got this uh, title in Budapest, and it happened that in Budapest I gave one of my first international uh, papers, and then it was highly sophisticated mathematical theory of optimization based on cone theory, which I'm sure I would not understand this paper at the moment. And so <laughs> <laughs> it was nearly 30 years ago. But then, you know, uh, I, I, I panicked after several months uh, because I discovered that the solution set is empty. Right? So okay. there is no solution. But then when I, <laughs> as I said, what stupid thing I produced and because it was so complicated, so people, I mean, not, not many people go, like, a, uh, maybe it was not an Einstein theory, but something like that, nobody understands. <laughs> yeah. And then, uh, but you see, I mean, my main, uh, my main thinking at the moment is, maybe this paper was not so stupid, because, see, what you have in real life, when you have a multi-criteria, multi-dimensional, non-linear optimization problems in business, this, the optimal solutions are uh, sets are also empty. You know? Yes, <laughs> yes, yes, yes. So this is, you know, this is what we can bring uh, from science. That so uh, I mean, in contrast to mathematical models, uh, which are mostly linear and sometimes uh, nonlinear, in the business problems has many dimensions, and there are no optimal solutions. Uh, I mean, there's, uh, you always need to choose between. Uh, some suboptimal solution. Yeah? So when this type of thinking helps in many situations because it's in practical in practicality. You know, so like we have a tender, yeah? there is a yeah. situation in which I should compromise between price, risk, uh, <laughs> and uh, you know this responsibility. Uh, how far I can go with uh, how much uh, risk we can take as a vendor again again uh, against the, the customer. Then there is not a mathematical or good answer to that. It's, it's gut feeling and then so we should some uh, some calculations of penalties in the contract. So, so we should uh, we should recommend to the Polish Academy of Business that uh, every chief executive should spend five years studying theoretical <laughs> physics. Then, <laughs> <laughs> Alvin, back to you. Well, uh, one thing that I'm interested in, I've I've heard it said that you believe any business technology specialist can be replaced by a small number of students. No, a finite number of a students. A finite number of so students. It was very mathematical. <laughs> so tell us about that. No, no, so, uh, oh, okay, I mean, it's, uh, it's the saying is that each, each specialist can be substituted by finite number. It, it was, uh, I'm not sure if I said so, but it was. Uh, uh, well, you've been quoted, so it must uh, be true. It was. <laughs> I mean, it comes from the beginning of our company where uh, we were, we, where I employed a lot of students, but it was not strange because uh, we, we Poland was uh, Poland, as I mentioned, 
Poland uh, in private uh, companies and the IT business was very young, so uh, there, were, there were no real specialists. So we, we based development of our company on talented students and we were criticized by our competition for that, you know, so uh, yeah. And then, uh, so there was one factor. And the second factor was, uh, so they use it as uh, something against us, that the student company is not, you know. <laughs> um, and the second, uh, uh, second uh, problem was that our, whenever we got someone with experience, such person was always, always got an offer, uh, job offer from our competition. So what could I do? <laughs> <You know? laughs> It was not uh, my wish, but it was a real life situation that you know it was uh, that we lost specialists. And we needed to substitute with uh, uh, with uh, some new uh, newly employed people, students. So maybe it happened that to one of our uh, managers when he ca came and said, "Oh, we lost again the very good specialist." I said, "Yeah." <laughs> well, uh, I find it very intriguing because uh, I majored in mathematics, and so. Uh, I don't, I can't get into quantum physics or anything, but I, I understand applied math, and and I was just wondering if if it was really true, how many students do you think it would take to replace me and John? <laughs> yeah, I mean, it's a good question. Uh, see, I will not answer uh, it because I, want to, I, I try to be nice to you. <laughs> <laughs> yes. <coughs> What you, what you mean is you could replace us by the number of students you could count on the fingers of one finger. <laughs> <laughs> well. So you, 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 you entered this territory, you know. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Yeah, that, that begs the follow-up question, though, that, you know, how many would it take to replace you? Uh, one, my son. <laughs> <laughs> oh, well, I've, I've really enjoyed this conversation, and uh, I know some of these things were kind of tongue-in-cheek. But uh, in closing, what three pieces of advice about IT development would you like to make uh, to this audience? I mean, yeah, so... Uh, uh, first of all, I mean, if, if you, nowadays, yes, we are in a recession, so, I mean, uh, quite often what I'm saying, you know, is uh, it was much easier for me to start a company than for uh, young people nowadays. They, they need a lot of persistence in what they are doing. Quite often they, um, they just start the project and they wait uh, to, uh, to, to, to be appraised, you know, to be, uh, I mean, uh, 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 yeah. To, to get big money after one or a couple of years, you know, for the, what they are doing in innovation. Now it requires a lot of persistent hard work, hardship, and, uh, and then, you know, not just selling their the idea, the innovation, but trying to get through, uh, through a hardship, as I said, I mean, suffering at the personal level, and only then they can uh, succeed. So there's one advice. Uh, second thing is that uh, they should find as soon as possible, people around them, customers, potential users of the innovation, which uh, could work with them on the development of the innovation. So we are very lucky in our company that through those tw last 20 years, we, were, uh, we managed to meet uh, on customer side people who wanted to take risk uh, with us without reward, in fact. Yes. So I was rewarded, our people were rewarded, our company was rewarded. And those people on customer side, you know, they took all the risk, responsibility. And, uh, you know, there is a problem of innovation at the moment that if we succeed with innovation, we have a new product and so forth. Customer side manager takes the risk. If uh, the innovation is, let's say, not successful, he's punished. If it is successful, reward of, of a person on customer side is small. So I wish young people, you know, that they can meet such people on let's say customer, potential customer side who could uh, um, help them to work with like friends uh, uh, with their new ideas. Yeah? And third one is I, th um, uh, I think that funded funding schemes from European Union should be uh, uh, significantly changed to assist such people with funding over a longer time horizon. It is impossible that uh, IT or uh, in modern society very competitive where we compete globally 
um, to succeed with a funding, you know, one year or two years, it is not enough in IT to uh, to get through to, to market which regional or international uh, in such a short time with such, you know, initial funding. So these are my three advices or wishes. And of course, they should have laughed. So. <laughs> so <laughs> <laughs> well, Please I would like to thank you very much for this uh, mastermind interview. Uh, I thank think you. everyone has enjoyed it, and I really appreciate that you traveled all the way from Milan today to be with us my here, pleasure. and we thank really you. do appreciate it. Thank you. My pleasure. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.